Finding the right jeans is hard. Accepting your jeans is even harder. Whether you wear boyfriend or boot cut, high rise or low rise, this podcast will teach you to love the jeans you are in. I'm Rachel. And I'm Tina. And we're going to use modern research to bust diet myths and get real about body after baby. We're going to take you on a journey of unpacking your old beliefs about food and weight so you can learn to nourish your body and raise body confident kids. So put your booty in a chair and let's talk mom jeans. This episode you're about to listen to has a few choice words. So if you're listening with your children in the car, earmuffs. Thank you. All right, mamas, welcome back to Mom Jeans. This episode, we are going to be talking about your belly jeans with a J. So how many of you are self-conscious about your stomach? Our guess is that if you have come to this episode, it is because you're wondering how to make peace with your midsection. So welcome. (laughs) If you think about it, how we feel about our bellies really impacts our identity and our self-acceptance since we live in a society whose cultural construction of beauty consists of flat bellies. Whether your belly was always more rounded than your friends going growing up, was flat and subconsciously part of how you evaluated your worth and confidence, or has drastically changed of you as you've aged, for some, experienced pregnancies, belly acceptance is a piece of body acceptance. Yeah, and if you listen to our last episode, it was all focused on belly acceptance from the inside out, meaning what part of your changing belly is from genetics and internal compositions. We gave you lots of education with body acceptance at the forefront of our education. So today, we got a little compromise. We are still going to give you some education. and then We have to. We have to do it. We can't help it. Can't help it. We're going to discuss, though, the education about your belly from the outside in. So like what you can see in your genes with a J. And if those genes fit differently over the years, how you can practice self-care and body acceptance. So we are going to continue with our style of education in the first half of this episode because, honestly, we can't help it. Like we said, it's it's in our bones. It's in our genes. With a G. <laughs> oh, there we go. G, G, G. And then we are going to interview an amazing mama whose body acceptance message is all about the abdomen. And we'll do this in the second half of the episode. At one point, we did a survey with mamas to talk about what topics they wanted us to discuss. And these four points were brought up most often. So to try to keep it brief, we are going to discuss the four common points and concerns that females have had with the external appearance of their changed bellies and highlight body acceptance movements to help you learn to love the skin you're in. So these four areas of how to love your belly, jeans with a J, are, drum roll, (laughs) the mom pooch, the impact of the diastasis recti, (laughs) our skin's changed appearance, And lastly, should you expect to get your pre-baby belly back? All right, before we get into those, we have to go into the stereotypes. I mean, the biggest stigma about the mom bod is the softened, rounded tummy. Saying goodbye to those pre-baby abs, if you even had them to begin with, or if you do have them post-baby, being hated for it by all of your friends. The semi-pregnant looking belly that never goes away. Saying goodbye to low-rise jeans and hello to high-rise or mom jeans because your hips and stomach have changed shape. And that's just for the small population of moms who maybe had a flatter stomach to begin with. I mean, so many struggle with the beauty idea of a flat stomach because their genetics never had that in the cards for them. So embracing their belly is actually work they've already struggled to do for a long time. I mean, a lot of moms have a history of yo-yo dieting, eating disorders, money spent on Pilates DVDs and ab rollers because they have struggled with their body image since they were young. Yeah, women are bombarded with the flat stomach messaging starting at such a young age and it's sad. And becoming a mom just adds another layer to a challenging piece of body acceptance. And we really want to acknowledge that pain that so many women have gone through in their hatred of their midsection. We are really so passionate about calling about 
out the bullshit of diet culture because we know the pain as eating disorder professionals. We have seen the worst of how this pain manifests in food behaviors and in self-harm. And we see how the belly changes during refeeding and from years of abuse. So please, when you see another mom struggle with her belly acceptance or see pain in her eyes when a stranger asks her when she is due, when you honestly know the baby is already here or she's just living in a body that has a belly like we all are, know that the pain might go back very, very far or that their body's just shaped that way and that's honestly okay. It seems like in all of our episodes we have some sort of disclaimer But that is because we are very conscious that no one else's story is the same. And we always want to make sure we check our privileges and consider all perspectives and stories. And if you are wondering why two cisgendered women living in smaller bodies are talking about acceptance in this challenging area, it's because we're so passionate about it and about all bodies finding belly acceptance and body liberation. We hope that our education and body acceptance points will make this a safe space for all people. All right. So first, when we did our survey asking people what they wanted us to cover about the belly, jeans with a J, we kept getting a lot of questions about, can you tell us about this mom pooch and what does that even mean? So basically, it's the stereotype we mentioned. It's the softer, rounder belly. And the reasons for this are varied. So we'll give you a little education on it. The first is that it's largely due to the diastasis recti, Tina's favorite word. So don't worry. She'll go over this in a few minutes. I'll do it. Another reason is having a C-section. This can lead to a quote-unquote pooch because the surgery cuts through the abdominal skin and muscles. Ouch. It also medically can be referred to as a shelf of tissue. So you can rest your tissue box on the little shelf when you're crying, trying to get out of bed the next day. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It hurts so bad. I've had a C-section. So I needed that little shelf for my tissues. But honestly, it's because the C-section scar most likely adhere to the muscle below or it's growing roots in the scar that can attach to underneath layers. And if you want more information on this, if you go back and listen to episode 17, your pelvic floor, our pelvic floor therapist that we interviewed touches on this. So when this happens, the scar is basically not able to move freely, nor allow the skin, fat, and muscle to move freely. Sadly, most of our research on this was just so steeped in tips of weight loss, burning belly fat, and it even just sent us links to plastic surgeons. We just wanted some education for you all because most of what we found is just cosmetic concerns that we need to change our dialogue around and only a small percentage of any of these C-section scar issues are actually something that need follow-up medical care and that would be from chronic nerve pain. So Tina brought it up earlier because we're eating sort of professionals. We also are always interested on the yo-yo dieting piece and refeeding for malnourishment, which can impact the mom pooch. So Tina, can you share a little bit about that? Yes, I could literally talk about this forever. So I'm going to condense it uh, and use some of my uh, lovely analogies. But let's make sure that we are acknowledging that our body have has feelings And so I want you to pretend that your body is your friend. Now, could you imagine constantly being mean to a friend day in and day out? And they just continue to show up for you. They continue to care for you and they continue to be your friend. Aw, I feel sad on all angles. (laughs) Well, that's what your body's doing to you. It continues to show up for you, take care of you, utilize the energy that you give it. It wakes you up. It beats your heart. It does all these things, even if you treat it like crap. (laughs) In my practice, I see so many people making food choices just so that they can change their quote unquote trigger areas. And in this episode, talking about the stomach or wanting to achieve this thin ideal that just isn't right for them or 99.5. 8% of the population. (laughs) So instead of actually getting that flat stomach or thin body, their body is put through torture. And then in the end, their body ends up being in a place that maybe it wouldn't have ended up in as a protection mechanism. We know that through our work, seeing so many people go through years and years of dieting and abusing their bodies, that their set point and normal body range ends up being adjusted. It just has to. 
our bodies can really only handle so much. Or in the cases where maybe an eating disorder is present or severe malnourishment, the body cannot tolerate that intense deprivation and malnourishment forever. Many times I talk with clients about how they wish that they could go back to the body before their disordered behaviors or before the baby because even though they were unhappy with it then, they feel really uncomfortable now. Deprivation has a rebound effect. We can't change that. And most often it means that our body is going to hold on to more weight as a form of protection. I'm sorry that this, this statement might honestly piss some people off, but it really is the reality. And I hope that it will influence y'all to choose self-care and nourishment inst- instead of forcing a flat stomach. So our second point is, why does our skin change shape or appearance on our stomach area? So basically, our skin is an organ. And just like every other organ in our body, we have to engage in self-care skills in order to keep that organ healthy. I mean, if we don't treat our skin well, it changes its appearance as a result. So we aren't going to sell you any vitamins or lotions here because the best way to take care of your skin is to nourish it, to keep it hydrated, and to keep it out of the sun. So wear that sunscreen. Also, stop smoking, please. There's research out there that shows that smoking decreases the length of our telomeres, which are strands in our DNA that Tina is now going to tell us all about. Yes. What the hell are telomeres? Ooh, I don't know, but I really like that word. It sounds right. Fun. Telomeres. I'm going to name my next child telomere. Oh, boy. <laughs> my next chicken. That sounds better, right? <laughs> there you go. So our skin is a self-renewing tissue that needs to shed itself to prevent diseases like cancer. Ooh, we're all we're all similar to snakes. Telomeres are necessary at the end of our chromosomes as a way to prevent double-stranded breaks. Well, what the hell does that mean? I'm going to give you another analogy. Here we go. Have you ever tried to lace up your shoe without that little plastic piece on the end? Well, it's really freaking hard, right? Yeah, that sounds, that sounds tricky. That little plastic thing is called an aglet. That'll help you in your upcoming trivia games. Perfect. Um <laughs> Well, our telomeres are those little aglets. They help our DNA strands deliver the messages correctly. Eventually, our telomeres will shorten to the point where there is nothing left. And either that cell dies, stops working, or goes into a state called senescence, (laughs) which basically means you are aging. Aw, we all are going to do it. So without the telomeres, the DNA strands will fuse and genetic instability will occur. We all shed our telomeres and this is just going to happen. It happens as a natural result, uh, result of aging. But there are also different agents that speed up this process like we were talking about sun exposure and smoking. I'm not a scientist, but that's just the basics. So the bottom line is when you look in the mirror... And you or your age, your pregnancies or weight changes have led to that saggy stomach skin. Just scream telomeres. Telomeres. <laughs> that is our new mirror affirmation for you. Those are just my telomeres. Hashtag telomeres. <laughs> there you go. Another way our skin changes when it grows is by getting stretch marks. Now, we're not going to go over that in this episode because we did an entire episode on stretch marks way back in episode three, Your Genes with a G, for you to go back and listen to. The bottom line is that genetics are at play as to whose skin reacts to the stretching and changing with stretch marks and whose doesn't. And a little spoiler alert, it's not about who used the cocoa butter. Y'all, have you seen your bellies when you're pregnant? I mean, mine was so big that if a big windstorm came in, it would have blown me over. I was so unbalanced. It is amazing. (laughs) Yeah. And it stretches so much that there honestly is no way that unless your genetics tells you it is, that it is going to go back to the way it was before you were pregnant. Or if you have gained weight over the years, your skin is stretched and that's okay. But it's not going to go back to the way that it was. Yeah, and lastly, I mean, our skin is just naturally going to sag thanks to a decrease in of two important proteins called elastin and collagen. So elastin does exactly what it sounds like. It adds elasticity to our skin. 
Collagen is constructed of tiny fibers, which keep the skin tight. So over time and as we age, these proteins are naturally going to decrease. This causes skin to look saggy, wrinkled, or leathery. And it's just going to happen no matter what you do. So for some of those of you who became moms via pregnancy, the stretching of the skin during that pregnancy just leads to a certain appearance post-baby, the loose skin and the wrinkled belly that no diets or exercise or weight loss will change. So if you are struggling with that body acceptance because of the skin on your abdomen, we want you to be weary of consulting diet culture about how to quote unquote fix this. Yeah, because if you do a quick Google search or even talking to medical providers on what to do about your stomach appearance, you will get so many crazy results and opinions. Some research does have scientific evidence of effectiveness of improving your skin, and those are usually the ones that treat the skin as an organ, and they might even have added benefits for your general physical or mental health as well. But the rest are pretty much cosmetic fixes only and just steeped in diet culture. They're also steeped in the pressure to conform to beauty ideals, or they're just a bullshit business. They're all expensive and just a moneymaker for our diet industry. Don't even get us started on that. Most of them are super painful and just not worth it. And almost none of them have any scientific evidence on effectiveness. I also want to acknowledge and create some space for those individuals that might have extra skin that gets in the way and can cause physical complications. I have worked with a lot of clients that have shared the frustration with this skin and how it can create challenges in their life or added body image struggles, difficulty cleaning under the skin, getting in the way, difficult to find clothes, they don't feel comfortable in their clothes or in their body, or even really going out in public. If you feel that you're experiencing this struggle, then I would recommend reaching out to a healthcare professional like a therapist or a dietitian that can help you explore this body image acceptance further. Yeah, I mean, thanks to genetics, every person's belly will react in its own unique way. And that mama is what makes you beautiful and amazing. I mean, personally, since we're all about breaking diet legacies in our families, I will disclose that my mom struggled with the acceptance of this so much that she got a tummy tuck when I was in high school. And this, of course, impacted my fear of my body changing with pregnancy, and it led to some disordered beliefs about the changing, aging body that I've had to work hard on unpacking as I've navigated body acceptance and worked in this profession. Unpacking our beliefs about women's bodies, our family legacy, or even cultural narratives are a key piece in body or belly acceptance. You can be a sexy mama with wrinkly skin, and you can rock a sexy two-piece with a rounded belly. Mama, you do you. Snaps. That was good. (laughs) (laughs) All right, third. What is the diastasis recti? I feel like I'm Henry sleeping, and I feel like I'm going to wake him up by doing that. You guys, this is Tina's favorite term. <laughs> Listen to previous episodes and you'll see why. I don't even know if it's pronounced that way, but anyways. Okay, how does it affect our muscular tone and the, appear- the appearance of our bellies? Diastasis recti is the separation of your abdominal muscles. It occurs when the right and left belly muscles have widened and your belly sticks out because of that space. It's literally your insides coming out. <laughs> Because there's nothing holding it in. This isn't a tear, but it's a stretching of the connective tissues along the linea alba, where the ab muscles meet. And about two-thirds of pregnant women have it because pregnancy puts so much pressure on the belly that sometimes the muscles in the front can't keep their shape. I had it, and mine was four fingers wide, and my entire abdominal area felt so weak, but I didn't know if that was because my ab muscles were stretch and my intestines were coming out or if there was just a large baby growing inside of me I don't know which one (laughs) it is also the thing that keeps jeans fitting differently even when you are the same as you were pre-pregnancy and at the extreme diastasis recti can be connected to lower back pain abdominal pain and even pelvic floor problems Just a side note, we found this interesting information that newborn babies also can have this belly spread. I know, and it should go away on its own. And men can get it as well, possibly from yo-yo dieting or from doing sit-ups or weightlifting the wrong way or for some other causes. So the risk factors for having diastasis recti are having multiple pregnancies, especially close in age, having multiples, 
or having an underlying abdominal problem. Sadly, OBGYNs don't routinely screen for this or discuss abdominal separation. Despite the fact that up to 60% of women experience it to some degree during their first year postpartum. That's a lot. Yeah, and my doctor never asked me about it from any of my pregnancies. And an estimated 33% are dealing with it beyond that. Dr. Elwin Mommers. Oh, what? That's their real name? Perfect name. Amazing. Is a lead researcher on diastasis recti. And his, in his studies, all of the clinical interventions for healing this condition, he found that there is no exact cure or fix. We linked his findings in the show notes for you because he extensively reviews each op- option, different surgery techniques and physical therapy, how to evaluate which option might be best for each person, and how each person is different in the way that their body reacts to intervention. I do want to self-disclose that I went to a pelvic floor therapist for my diastasis, and we did very gentle exercises, which basically felt just like breathing, and it went away on its own own but the most important thing that I did was I did not do any sort of ab workouts or core training because I just needed to let the abs come back together and heal perfect just throwing that out there all right lastly what are the expectations for her bellies after baby like what can we expect I mean, recently I was looking at my son, he's about four, and he was lying in my bed watching TV and sucking his thumb in the very early morning hours. Um, His little PJ shirt was like hiked up and his big round belly was just breathing up and down. It was so squishy and delicious. I mean, trust me, I like leaned over and gave him all these belly kisses. But then I kind of was thinking about it, and I realized that most adult bellies are just as round and squishy and stick out from our tops if we lay or sit a certain way. And why is that not delicious? I mean, at what point does our society chastise the soft belly? And why do we put pressure on ourselves to have a rock hard one? Like, why can't adults have the same belly as toddlers? I'm just really, you know, interested about all the societal expectations on this. Yeah, I think it comes down to checking our expectations. Depending on your genetics, your age, your DNA's reaction, or your time and money spent on interventions, everyone's bellies will be as unique as they are. Just remember, our goal is to dismantle an entire system of oppressive diet culture that makes 72 freaking billion a year. Come on. So much money. So much money. Telling you that there is something wrong with your appearance. Your belly holds some of the most important organs, including those that can lead to growing a baby. And the organ of the skin that holds it all in has the ability to change shape if needed. I mean, damn. How cool is that? Your belly doesn't exist to look good in lingerie. It exists to keep you alive. And you can look good. Lingerie. And you can look good in that lingerie with your wrinkly skin. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. So I live in Orange County. So I have to throw in a perspective here. And that is, what about the moms that do have the flat stomach and abs? We cannot speak for everybody or every person's journey, but we think we can safely say that it is mostly genetics and a lot of engagement in diet culture. Listen, we all have a choice in how we spend our time, our money, and what we value. We have a choice if we're going to engage in diet culture, spend hours a day in the gym, count all of our freaking macronutrients, sign up for every bar and Pilates and boot camp class, and just put a lot of value on the currency of our body in this culture. If we worship thinness, and a flat stomach. How we spend our time will reflect that. And our society sadly rewards it, which keeps so many people stuck in this cycle and the lies of diet culture. I mean, we really are so passionate about preaching the fact that embracing moderation and body kindness is key. You can care for your skin, your organs, your bodies with movement and nutrition that is convenient, accessible, realistic, and develop a value system that is not super focused on your body and appearance, but on other character traits and family time. 
And this might mean embracing having a different belly shape, and there might be a grieving process that we're letting go of increasing worth in the eyes of our society. But if our bodies are currency in this culture, we don't want our hands on any of that dirty money. Mm -mm -mm. No, thank you. Nope, I don't want any of your dirty money. Honestly, every time we let go of the pursuit of external validation, we are one step closer to full body and soul peace. I also want to circle back to Rachel's example and double standard, especially when diet culture throws us the bullshit of belly fat being unhealthy. See previous episode on that, please. I mean, if having if having a flabby belly is that bad, then why is it okay for our kids to have it? Is it not until we are all faced with culture that is sending us the message of what looks okay or not okay that we start realizing maybe our belly should look a different way? Otherwise, all babies would be born with a six pack. <laughs> Could you imagine that? No, that'd be so weird. Your baby comes out and it's six pack abs. It's ripped. No. Remember mm-hmm. how you were born and how society is what changed the standard, not your body. Woo! Okay, so now that we have discussed our four points. We are going to jump into a chat we had with Jasmine Steiner, a mom and personal trainer, all about how her relationship with her belly changed and stretched her soul. So let's check it out. All right. Today we are welcoming Jasmine Steiner. She is a conscious coach, self-love advocate, lover of veggies, and most grateful for the title of mom and wife. She calls her postpartum journey a kind of rebirth due immensely to the magically awe-inspiring influence the birth of her three children have had in her life. Now learning to live with a heightened sense of gratitude, self-love, and compassion, Jasmine wants nothing more but to share the beauty of her struggles in hopes of helping other women. Well, what a beautiful bio. Thank you for coming on our podcast. (laughs) I need a lot of your gratitude in my life. (laughs) It was a, it's been a process, but it's a beautiful one and I'm grateful for it. So, and thank you for having me on your show. I'm so grateful to even be here. <laughs> so tell us your story of body acceptance. I mean, did you like struggle with your body growing up or with disordered eating and how did becoming a mom trigger this even more? Could you share your story with us? Yeah, of course. Um, it's so I've always kind of had issues growing up because like I've kind of, <laughs> this is like really weird, but I kind of had a bigger butt than a lot of my friends. And I always thought there was something wrong with me. And I hated wearing shorts because everybody else could wear shorts, but I couldn't. And so I always felt when I was like, even younger that there was something different about me that I didn't necessarily appreciate um, because I didn't get to have some of the luxuries other people had. And so it started young with like little things like that. Um, you know, even with like being biracial was something I struggled with because I had friend I remember vividly in elementary school when what uh, these twins they were Hispanic and they're like you're too dark to hang out with us and so I started learning like maybe I'm just like not the right color <laughs> you know and so it just kind of like morphed and then in high school I was always like a little awkward and and so it just it, it just slowly started it's like a snowball effect it just slowly started accumulating and then I got into fitness where I was like oh I can like hyper control this problem I feel like I've had And I started competing in bodybuilding and that's kind of where I went to the extreme of, I even got to becoming like bulimic and it was just anything I could do to have a sense of control. And I felt like I could do that through fitness and ceased right after my twins were born. I was competing right before I had my twins. I did my first show. And so it, uh, the stomach has always been something like I'm like I always had a six pack and I was like I was like shredded and I just like I swear I didn't own anything but crop tops um <laughs> for a long time and <laughs> and so that's why like it's kind of the focus of my page because it's something I was so proud of before and I had to realize um that my value wasn't based on that <laughs> and so I had my twins and I had this extreme she was an extreme troll bully and it actually knew her in real life and I just found out like a year ago who she was she bullied me for two and a half years and she told me one time you're going to be nothing but stretch marks and saggy skin and when she told me that I was like I refuse to allow this title to be like the end all for me and I fought that like that that moment I was like I have to fight it because and when I saw myself 
right. I remember crying after I had my twins because I was like, why do I look like this? My stomach was like hanging over my incision. I had to like lift it up just to even see it. And I, I was like horrified. So I, did, I didn't know. I looked at social media and I saw these women who like had perfectly flat stomachs, like, you know, a couple of weeks after they had their babies and then I'm like, well, what, like, am I broken? Like, look, there's something wrong with me. And it wasn't something that I felt was spoken about because a lot of women that I've come in contact with, like, that's a very like sensitive part of their bodies, even though it's like it created life, it like assisted and created life. It's, something we're very subconscious about like that's sort of like oh, I'm work- gonna wear one piece to hide it but it's like there's nothing to hide it's like it's nothing broken about it it's, and after after the twins I was like no I, I have to learn to love myself because I got really depressed I had extreme postpartum depression and anxiety and I had to do a lot of releasing my ego and letting go of who I thought I was which was just a physical person um, that could only contribute their body to society and realizing like I was more than that and having to come, come to enlightenment on that and be like, Oh, I actually have things of value besides my six pack. (laughs) You know, like I have words of wisdom, like I'm a smart person yet. I like somehow forgot that during that time. It just like didn't exist to me anymore. Yeah. I think you're speaking to such an important angle, which is, Hey, you know, there's, these insecurities that I'm experiencing and I have found an outlet of control and maybe it felt easy to you or something along those lines, but there was an outlet and that was your body. But then when we have something like birthing kids and growing kids in your body to where we really don't have control over that, it's amazing how that really morphed and shifted into a better value system. I love that. Um, So that kind of like brings me into kind of our second question for you, which is you're a personal trainer. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Hey, okay. And (laughs) with that, it's like you had this disordered relationship with exercise before and how has that then shifted after becoming a mom or how have you used your personal training to kind of promote that better body image um well one I think the biggest thing for me is I learned not to be so hard on other people because I was kind of like like a Julian Mitchell's type of trainer like very intense like I don't care like I don't care what you have going like you need to just do this do the burpees right now don't stop I don't care if you're crying keep going you know I I realized like coming back from like the postpartum journey like it is hard it's not easy and I had to be more kind to myself and it's like crazy how they say you you to truly love others you have to learn to love yourself and I think that kind of applies in that situation where like I had to learn how to be patient with myself to be more patient with others and and so that was like a huge aspect of it for me and it became less like I am a personal trainer but it became less about the body but I I would that's why I call it more conscious coaching because it's like I will write you a workout plan like with a client now it's like we don't work on working out the first thing like I understand that that's one of your goals is to get healthy and that's perfectly okay but we are going to work on our mindset first. We're going to work on accepting our bodies first as they are before we try to fix it. Cause it's nothing to fix. It's just like, it's, it's to help improve our mental states. It helps improve our stamina. So we can run around with our kids, like to, to come at it, not from a perspective of needing to achieve a certain physical appearance, but to have a overall sense of health and well being. And so that's how it's kind of like transformed for me personally with my clients um, and you asked another question right at the end. Well, so how has becoming a mom kind of shifted that? And it's, it seems like you're more caring and nurturing it versus like, do it now. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's, it, yeah, that's definitely the, been the change. It's the biggest change. Yeah. Which it sounds like you 
went from exercising to actually engaging and teaching others how to engage in joyful movement, which Rachel and I are really big believers in that like we can engage in joyful movement in a variety of ways. Um, and it definitely involves self-care and love and compassion and having a positive mindset. So I love that you're speaking to that. Thank you. Yeah, it definitely, um, it's, it's something that I never would have thought I would have gotten into or necessarily even acknowledged, but I, I was going to school for psychology and it, I realized that psychology plays such a big part in even just fitness because you can work out, but like when you're too stressed out, cause like cortisol, like you're, it's going to negatively affect your body, you know? And it's like, you have to be able to get at the root of the problem first. Cause we want to fix like the outside issue. Like when a, a child's hitting, we want to be like, stop hitting. But it's like, well, why are they hitting? There's like something triggering that and co- trying to find the, the true root of why, you know? And that, I think that's been the, tra- the biggest thing for me is trying to find the root of the why I think you bring up an interesting point too about identity like for you your identity was the six-pack or how you looked and I think for moms we our identity shifts so much just becoming a mom and then when our body changes on top of it now we're struggling with this whole new sense of like who am I and what is my body and and what is my identity now so I like that you kind of have brought in the psychology piece because not only is just body acceptance, which is hard enough as it is, but it's also an entire like new way of viewing ourselves. And then this, this wrestling with who we are now. So it's, it's such a layers upon layers of unpacking different like narratives and identity pieces. It's true. Yeah. No, you know, you're like hundred percent right with that. So you mentioned your social media feed, which we found so encouraging. Um, you do a lot of posts about body acceptance around the abdomen area, to your point. So can you tell a little bit again, like, what is some of the passion behind your posts? Like, what do you feel like you want moms to know about healing their abdomen area physically or even just emotionally in the body acceptance process? Um, I share it because I felt when I first had like first like saw that my stomach was different and then even so like I would sit there when right after I had my kids and I'd be like oh well maybe in a month it'll get better and like maybe it'll get better and I'm like holding on to this like thought it's gonna get better and then like you know a year passes by I'm like I don't think this is getting better <laughs> you know and like having to like a person's like coming to terms with it like we always we first be like oh you gotta love yourself but it's like you just sometimes it's okay to like cry about what you thought was going to be. And it's like mourning that and that's okay. But then it's like getting past and like, okay, you know what? But I'm still here. I'm still be able to present, still be able to love and enjoy life. And for me, it was kind of like liberating because I wanted to hide it. I, I hid it like it was some like dirty little secret I had, like, you know, that was going to just end the world if someone found out. And so it, it was a way of like, you know what? My world didn't end because I, shared something very vulnerable about myself and it and it kind of allowed me to escape the the shackles of other people's perception of me I was like you know what it doesn't matter what you think about me even in a positive or negative light I just kind of learned to be neutral about it because there was a point I had a video it went viral it had like five million views and I had people tell me like oh my gosh I love I love you for this and people like you are disgusting you know like it was just so like it was it became draining looking at the the comments because it was like up and down up and down I finally got to the point I was like you know what I can't hold on to either of these like I can't put invest my energy into oh look how people are thinking about me positively and then being completely deflated when they think negatively and it just finding a neutral space of like okay this is my truth and I appreciate the positive, I appreciate the negative, really it's all a perception of other people's thoughts and projections upon me and that it's not really relevant to my truth. And so it's, it's, it's kind of been just more like a, like a, like a journey of, of releasing myself from other people's opinions and perceptions of me. And um, I don't know, it's just, it, it, it's just something I want moms to know. Like, I know a lot of like 
mom's coming to me like, I've never worn a bathing suit for like 10 years, like 20 years. My kids are like 20 years old and I finally wore a bathing suit because I felt like I could do it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, why? I'm like, how is this deemed bad? I'm like, we are carrying life. And yes, yeah, some of us have marks to show, but it just, it shows something we've been through, but it's nothing to be ashamed of. And I don't, and I, I post pictures of just like, you know, me being silly or me even being sexy. Cause I'm like, you can still be sexy and not have this perfectly flat stomach. And you can still like embrace like your sensuality and be like, more like be a woman you know not to just like hide away and be like oh well I just I gotta hide myself now and like it's like no be who you are like you, you can be who you were before just with the title of mom added to it like it doesn't have to be the end of the road for you to like enjoy that bikini you want because of like some stretch marks and saggy skin can you give our listeners like a and, and this of course isn't going to be the same for everyone but how long from start to now has it been for you to work on this healing journey for that stomach area well the thing is I don't think there is a timeline I think it's always a continual thing because there's still moments now when I'll like look in the mirror and I'll feel bad and I'll be like oh man like maybe I should get a tummy tuck and then I have to like talk to myself and then I like, realize I'm like wait okay it's okay that you're feeling this like you're you're about to start your period like you're bloated <laughs> you're gonna like calm down <laughs> You know, and I think it's not a timeline thing because sometimes we hold on to, like, we hold on to timelines, you know, like where it's like, oh, well, she did this in three months, so I should be able to do it too. And it's like, no, it's like, it's like a commitment to yourself of like, there's going to be hard days. It's like a marriage to loving yourself. And it's like loving yourself through the worst and the best moments. And you have to find gratitude for your body. And it may not necessarily be like this overwhelming self-love all the time. But just like trying to find like the neutral moments of like, you know what, my body did this for me today. My body took took breath so I could experience life. Like my legs were walking so I could run with my kids and like all these things where you can find gratitude in the things your body does that may not necessarily be an aesthetic thing, but more so on just a deeper level of like appreciation. And like even for me, like it it took a while, even because I had recovering from twins is kind of a lot. <laughs> and so like, you know, it was just it, it took like I would say probably a year till I kind of felt a little back into myself you know and I think one of the biggest things I had a mom reach out to me and it's crazy she's actually a psychologist herself and she's like I tell my clients all these things about be radical like just go for it like love yourself and all these things she's like but I can't do it myself she's like it's so hard because like I I don't know where to start like I have a prolapse and I have all these issues and the thing I told her was like, start with like, start with the prolapse, start with the diastasis, start with repairing the things you can work on. You know, like I know prolapse for me caused like, you know, urine incontinence and like sexual pain and stuff like that. And that was, that was really, that was hard for me to deal with and had to work on healing that. And so I would tell anybody like work on it from the inside you know, do make sure like having a strong core, it's more valuable than having a core that necessarily other people like are going to ooh and ah over, you know, like I would rather not have diastasis than to have a flat six packs. Like it's like, or like a flat stomach, you know, it's like it, it the functionality of it is more important than, than the looks of it. I think it's important for mom listeners to hear that of like, Hey, look, this this is really a choice that I'm making that it's a constant commitment to myself that even though I may be feeling negative body image, I may have a day where I'm thinking about tummy tucks or whatever, not feeling like I can look in the mirror. I'm committing to myself that I'm choosing self-care and not going to choose those things in the end, even though the thoughts are occurring. I think you bring up a really good point, which is confidence is internal, not external. Like it's not once you get that body back or you feel like you your body's acceptable enough to wear a two piece, quote unquote, I'm doing quote things there, um, that you can feel confident. Like it is such an internal thing. Like you're not or no nobody's going back to anything because it's changed. That's what it is. It just is what it is. And confidence is something that's internal. And the more we expose ourselves to other images and other narratives about what bodies can and do look like I think it helps with that so I think that's where probably your feed is so helpful for people because they're going 
when I see more and more and more of those images that are counterculture, it helps me then feel like, okay, I can be confident no matter what, because it's such an internal dynamic. But one of the reasons we one of the reasons we also loved your story was because you have the personal trainer component, you know, and I think that it's okay for for women and moms to kind of go through this concept of how do I want to move my body and what does it mean to strengthen or exercise or like what what does that look like in the name of the body positive movement? So we wanted to kind of pick your brain on how moms can exercise to strengthen that core internally and their bodies from the inside out without engaging in diet culture. That's <laughs> like one of those trick questions, isn't it? <laughs> well, <laughs> oh no, not at all. <laughs> it is. It, it's not a trick question, but it's definitely a it's, tricky question. <laughs> it's like a it's yeah. a hard question. Yeah. It's a tricky question because you know it. It's like oh well, work out you know, it's good for your mind, but then it gets to the point of like, well, when do you like, like, when does it stop of like health to, you know, obsess obsessive, like aesthetic thing. And like, for me, that's something I've had to deal with more. So after my third, after my twins, I still found myself like, like, I love my stomach, but I still want to have this like certain look. And like this time I've come to realizing okay I it's a, one is a lot harder with three kids <laughs> it was a lot easier with the twins but it kind of made me have to sit back and realize that I do what I can when I can and my goal is like okay right now for myself it's like I find that I'm in a better mental state for myself and my kids when I do you know release the dopamine by working out and everything and I think it's just a balance of you know I'm not in the kitchen like micromanaging my food I'm like okay it's like listening to yourself and even it becomes to the point of like okay well do I want to eat this food because it makes me feel bad later or is it because somebody deemed it bad you know it's like okay and having to really use your own discernment and that's something like I and just still learning you know like moments of where I'm like oh I shouldn't be eating this I'm like no you can eat it and enjoy it and just be mindful because sometimes we eat and as moms especially we kind of just like guzzle things down because like for the baby wakes up and it it's kind of just learning to listen to your body and stop in those moments like okay am I really hungry and am I snacking because I'm like having an emotional moment or you know like emotional eating is something I struggle with too and so it, it just, it's really like tuning into myself and not going with the, is this good or bad? Or like, you know, oh, well, this woman says she works out like an hour a day and like, I need to be doing that and not comparing myself to someone else's like journey. Like if you want to train for a triathlon, like go freaking ahead, but don't do it because somebody else is making you feel like you need to do that. You know, do it because it's something you're passionate about. Like if you want to swim or do yoga or belly dance in your living room, you know, like to do things that make you feel good like well I think you bring up a good point of like hey there are all these different ways to be able to work on core you know and strength but if we're doing it for the purpose of to change our bodies to force our bodies to sit in a place that they don't want to be or to try to tighten up that belly or whatever it just isn't going to work because then we're engaging in compensatory behaviors or now the movement has gone to being exercise. And so I think you bring up a good point of like, hey, guess what? Belly dancing in your living room with your kids, that's strength. It's fun movement. I like your point too of like feeling better. Like especially this quarantine, my husband's like – um, I love you, but you need to go for a run. And he doesn't mean anything about my body. He means like change the attitude out there, girlfriend, and then come back, you know, like, and it's so true. It's like, yeah, sometimes I do need to work out to like change my mood or just get that space or to your point of like, especially working with the pelvic floor therapy, like, no, I want to work out to strengthen my core. So I stop peeing my pants whenever I sneeze. Like there are so many alternate reasons to find our why that w will make us feel good. That's not, well, I'll feel better when I look differently or I've lost the weight or whatever. So I think finding your why there's plenty of awesome whys out there that will help you feel better. And that's, but that's such an internal deeper process yeah I mean no matter how many sit-ups you do if your belly is meant to sag and it is stretched 
girl, that belly's not getting tight again. You know what I mean? Like you could have a really strong core, but you're still going to have the saggy skin. That's just, that's your new body. And we need to work on shifting that mindset. Yeah. And it's, um, I want to add to that with, cause I remember I was having a conversation with a mom and she was like, well, every time I work out I'm just like exhausted and then I'm exhausted all day and it just becomes something like, I don't want to do that. And I'm like, you don't have to go work out hard. You know, I even explained this to my husband because he's like, I can't go to the gym if I can't work out for a certain amount of time. I'm like, you don't have to like kill yourself. You know, you can go and just enjoy yourself like, and, and no one to stop. You don't have to make it this like super intense, like Instagram fitspo type workout, you know, it just can be something that feels good to you. And, you know, sometimes for me, that's like a 10 minute, you know, body weight circuit, you know, other times it's me running on the treadmill or running outside or, you know, just doing something that it doesn't have, like, it shouldn't make you feel like, oh man, I wish I would have never done that. It should make you feel like, wow, so energized for revitalized like this is so, I'm so glad I did it not feel the opposite you know would there be anything else that you would want to share with moms or individuals that are struggling with their belly area in particular or struggling with body image and accepting that one thing that I feel like really worked for me was kind of learning to like look in the mirror and to really look at ourselves like sometimes I feel like Whenever we're insecure about certain parts of our body, like I remember after the twins, I would never actually look at myself naked. I didn't want to see myself naked because I didn't want to acknowledge the truth. And sometimes it's just like radically saying like, okay, you know, this is a reality and looking at yourself and like seeing like, okay, you know what, like having a moment of like intimacy with yourself, like, and, and looking at yourself, not with judgmental eyes, you know, and, and and kind of like giving yourself a scam and like telling yourself, like, you know, what, like I love you and giving the affirmation. Like, there's nothing wrong with you. It's different. And we have this like idea of like the, like these cookie cutter societal expectations that are put on men and women. And it's like, well, you need to have this a certain appearance. And, th but that's not the case because the majority of people, like nobody looks the same. And we have these expectations based on like a small percentage of people. And to like look at yourself and, and to truly just <laughs> accept how you are in this moment. And I think that's like a good start is just to like acknowledge your truth, you know, and, and embrace that and find gratitude in it and tell yourself those affirmations. And it's going to sound feel crazy at first, but we're so used to the conditioning of our subconscious telling us like, I'm not good enough or I'm ugly or I'm this. And we don't even think twice about it but when we consciously think I am beautiful it becomes a weird behavior because we're so used to subconsciously telling ourselves that so how can people find you um on Instagram I'm at married mom and mantras and that's on YouTube and Facebook as well which I'm working on so well thank you so much for sharing your story and helping moms explore just this journey of belly acceptance thanks for coming on thank you for having me on your show yeah. and thank you for your patience of course thank you little one for joining us and being so sweet the whole yeah, time i know it's our first, oh, podcast. first podcast yeah this is our first podcast welcome you're famous now you're gonna go viral girlfriend <laughs> thank you thank you jasmine for sharing your story on here Please make sure you check her out on Instagram at Married Mom and Mantras. And our takeaway question is, if you are fighting against your genetics to achieve the societal ideal, then I want you to consider why you value that, where that message comes from, and what you are giving up in exchange for living in dissatisfaction with your belly. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye. This episode of Mom Jeans was produced and edited by Rachel Coleman and Tina LaBoy. Just a reminder, this episode is not a substitute for therapeutic counsel or nutrition advice. Thank you to Jerry DePizzo for the music production. You can find episode information and show notes at www.momjeansthepodcast.com. Follow us on Instagram at momjeansthepodcast. And join the Mom Jeans the Podcast Facebook group to find a community of mamas 
learning to love their bodies and discussing the episodes. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Mommy. See you next time.